Welcome back to Motlow College's Script Analysis for the Theater course. Today we'll be looking at Chapter 7 and 8 and examining August Wilson's The Piano Lesson. This is really comfortable terrain for me. I've been teaching Wilson um, off and on for the past, oh, 13, 14 years. As every uh, college that I've ever taught at has had Wilson as sort of the central piece of what they, um, of the the theater appreciation course, the intro to theater course. Wilson has had a huge influence on modern drama. Um, he, um, there was recently a blockbuster film that came out called Entitled Fences, which you may be familiar with, starring Denzel and Viola Davis, and um, just a really important author. Um, he never graduated from high school. He um, was in a Pittsburgh school and uh, was very accomplished reader and writer, and his teacher accused him of plagiarism, said that uh, he could never have written as well as he wrote, and he decided at that moment to give up institutional education, and he says he went to libraries and was relieved to be unshackled from institutional education. Um, I'm sure after he won his many Pulitzers, he probably felt like knocking on that teacher's door who accused him of plagiarism, but um, you can see that um, Wilson's very light-skinned. His father was white, but abandoned him as a young child, and he identifies himself as, as an African-American, as a black person, and he was very much part of the civil rights movement, um, and his sort of agenda is through this Pittsburgh cycle plays. He wants to tell every decade of um, the 1900s. He wants to tell from the perspective of black Americans and telling the history that was left out of the history books at that time. I think, I hope, we've gotten a little better about our inclusivity when it comes to history, but he wanted to make sure that those stories got told uh, of black people. So um, we look at kind of every cycle uh, every 10 years and it's depicted. So um, it's in Pittsburgh's Hill District. Um, it's in a, um, they are all for the sake of continuity, kind of in the same area where August Wilson himself lived. So he's telling the stories of his ancestors. But today, like, we'll look at um, a story that comes up from Mississippi and we'll examine Boy Willie's um, speech patterns, they're very much, he says fixin' to, he's a southerner, right? So um, a lot of these stories are coming right up after the Great Migration, where lots of people of color have um, moved north to uh, pursue a more lucrative life, and um, fewer things like um, Jim Crow laws and things escape those. Not to say that it was exactly a picnic when they got there. Oh, I also, I put not Cosby show. Um, probably shouldn't bring up Cosby anymore. But I just say that to say almost, you know, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, all these plays are in poverty, dealing with race issues. Um, they have grit to them, right? They have a grit to them. Uh, if you watched this version of Piano Lesson, it was the Hallmark version, and they cut out the N-word. <laughs> which uh, August Wilson was the playwright to that, and I'm kind of surprised he let them, because he was pretty passionate about writing the way that black people speak, wanted to reflect them as a historical document, to, to reflect the dialogue of what people are actually using, right? Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of people have trouble with Wilson when they go to see it live, because that N-word and just some of the slang that he uses is very rough. Um, but he says he wants to write as people speak, and he is a poet. Oh, is he a poet? He has a way with words. So, um, this Charles household genealogy is from the initial um, Broadway uh, playbill, um, and uh, you can see it's kind of it's a little bit confusing the family, primarily because we have like. Boy Willie, and then Papa Boy Willie. We have Bernice, and then we have Mama Bernice, which is, I think, very intentional about saying, you know, we inherit these 
sort of traits from our family? What are we inheriting as our legacy? If I had to give a super objective um, to piano lesson, I would say that it's all about discovering um, what do you do with this legacy we've been given? And of course that legacy is represented through this beautifully carved piano. But in what way do we move on and carry those stories with us? Or do those ghosts continue to haunt us in a way that frightens us? Right? So when it says origin, Sunflower County, that means Sunflower County, Mississippi. So, and that is where Boy Willie is coming up from when he meets us at the beginning of the play. Once again, these are my notes. Take it with a grain of salt. Um, Bernice, I think, is really our central character. She's the one who's enlightened at the end. Uh, but I think it could be it could be argued that Boy Willie is also a protagonist. They're both very complex characters, to use the language from last, last session. Um, so we see... I hesitated that last line on Bernice will not play the piano now because of course at the end of the play that sort of our climax is when she sits down to play the piano and faces her fears and her ancestors um, battle uh, in in that moment. It's a very esoteric moment. That's one of the things in teaching Wilson over the years that I have some students get very um, confused because Wilson is not he's not Aristotelian he's not gonna hand spoon feed you every meaning of everything uh, Wilson he likes blues he likes jazz he likes things to be a little more iggly wiggly rather than uh, straightforward so uh, don't be put off by uh, that if you can and and just embrace the jazz for what it is uh, so Bernice's love interests uh, are Avery, who is the preacher, a little bit of a, a, a goofy character who was trying to exercise the, the ghost, almost comically, I think. Um, and Lyman, who is Boy Willie's best friend, who, who is escaping the law. And Boy Willie is a fast-talking sort of hustler. He's He comes in and he's got a plan and he's trying to charm everybody. He's a little bit clumsy in it. Um, he wants to sell the piano and so that he can buy that farmland of his ancestors. He says, as long as I'm working on that farm, I'm a slave still to um, to this family. I want to buy the land and, and almost as revenge for my fathers, right? Um, above Boy Willie, we have Doker. This is Doker's house. He's He's obviously a financially stable individual which I think is outstanding at that time that he has worked as a railroad cook and maintains that even in his um, what August Wilson describes as a sort of beleaguered state that um, he's able to take in Bernice after Crawley dies and uh, he is our window to the past he's always telling us stories of the probably the most famously is the piano backstory and uh, in the blue box there in the top right hand corner we have whining boy he was uh, a recording star he was a blues musician played the piano and sang but he's sort of uh, gambled all his money away drunk up all his money and he comes around begging and asking for money very similar um, to other kind of archetypes that wilson uses in his plays um, there's kind of always the freeloader <laughs> uh, that uh, in in fences it's lions and and uh, we always kind of have a spiritual character too and so Avery is sort of an archetype as well. So Maritha is our future generation. I have her there at the very bottom of the screen because she is living on after us. She is the one that Boy Willie is trying to tell these stories to. She's the one who is learning to play the piano and, and from the, which the title comes, right? How are we going to teach this younger generation? How are we going to bring them into it? Grace, the other character on that bottom sort of row in the bottom left-hand corner, she is um, very thin character, just not thin physically, I mean thin in that she's just a pretty young girl who Boy Willie and Lyman also take turns hitting on her. So um, she kind of peeks in and out, but not a major character for us to be concerned with. So where did that title of the play come with? And in this chapter, we finally get that importance of the title included in the textbook. I've been, every time I analyze one of these little plays, I kind of tell you what I think the 
title of the play means because I think it's always a good starting place for interpretation um, but in this chapter we do have it pointed out the importance of the title of the play and figuring it out and sometimes a title of a play is just meant to hook our attention it's just meant to, meant to make us curious and want to know more um, but August Wilson is a historian he wants to dig in and give us a rich meaningful sort of um, indication with every poetic word that comes into his parts and so he's as he often does uh, has an influence of a piece of art to Romare Bearden has um, this lithograph here and you see how the mother is over her child and very forceful I think in her body language against her daughter and I think it speaks to you know how do we train up a child how do we um, what stories do we tell them and that sense of heritage what lessons are we going to hand down to them and what lessons uh, does the piano itself have for us through the heritage that kind of is coming through it um, so very colorful Romare Bearden and and I will say that this is not August Wilson's only play to be inspired by a Romare Bearden piece it's one of his favorite so all right, moving on to our textbook, and I'll use examples from piano lessons as I have kind of off and on. But one of the first lessons we have here from our textbook is um, aphorisms, right? Aphorisms are just little truths dropped in to that, and often kind of jingoisms, slogans, things that these characters believe. I will admit, this is probably my favorite August Wilson quote besides the Rose monologue from Fences. Oh my goodness, it's just beautiful. But this is not actually from Piano Lessons. This is from um, uh, this is from Joe Turner's Come and Gone. All you need in the world is love and laughter and that's all anybody needs. To have love in one hand and laughter in the other. I just think that's a beautiful uh, sentiment. So aphorisms when you find them in a play script they're often not just random conversations people are having they often point to a greater theme and give us a bigger picture of what's going on so um, it's funny some things get interpreted as aphorisms that I don't think are you know um, some people are born great some people achieve great and others have greatness thrust upon them from um, from Twelfth Night, uh, that's very much a sex joke, and it gets kind of used as an aphorism at graduation speeches and such. Um, but uh, there's also a, a character in Hamlet that's, you know, pretty bumbling and idiotic, and he's always speaking in tropes. And Shakespeare uses him as a sort of goofy character, and he has that very famous Shakespeare quote about, you know, don't a borrower lender be, and people people say that in earnest when really I think Shakespeare meant it in look at this goofy guy who's always sort of quoting the obvious so um, you got to be careful in thinking something is an aphorism you got to examine the text and context to make sure that it's not um, something being used ironically or at the expense of others but so we have allusions to outside authors uh oh I misspelled that didn't I litera too it's supposed to be literature obviously so Parchment Farm is alluded to early on in the script uh, and this is a very infamous work prison. Uh, three of the characters, Boy Willie, Lyman, and Doker, in fact Lyman is up here in Pittsburgh trying to escape working again in Parchment Farm. They've all done time there and they sing a song together from the chain gang. If you don't know what a chain gang is, uh, oh brother where art thou when they've got those chains connecting them. I will say Parchment Farm, you know, historically has been an, a place of abuse. Um, you know, there's lots of legend about um, uh, you know beatings and other things that have happened but it's not only been a place for people of color uh, women were institutionalized at Parchment Farm and it's now of course the Mississippi State Penitentiary and um, uh, Elvis's father spent time in Parchment Farm you can google those blues songs uh, Buka White has probably the most fa famous about Parchment Farm all very haunting all speaking about great injustice and uh, this is an even bigger theme in Joe Turner's Come and Gone about false imprisonment and the pain that uh, prison time has on a person's psyche. But we definitely see that all of these men have, have served time and um, 
Bernice kind of goes back and accuses all of these men and says, you're always stealing and killing and uh, calls them basically scandals. But um, it, it's definitely a theme of the work, this imprisonment. An allusion to Parchment Farm is one that would not be lost on a lot of the audiences. Imagery, hopefully this isn't your first time um, being exposed to the the concept of imagery. What is imagery? What is symbolism? And they're kind of intertwined depending on who you're talking to. But basically when a playwright tries to tap into our senses, our sensorial um, experiences, and I, I think I love that part where Bernice is talking about how her mother missing um, her father would polish the piano and we, we see this blood sweat and tears being rubbed into the beautiful finish of the piano and that that piece of that mu instrument or furniture kind of feels like it has a story of its own so you know um, my mother was a piano teacher and I can definitely uh, relate to the uh, chips and dings and I mean my mother's piano is pretty beat up and it, it's got a sense of history to it of course not the horrible history of, of um, your ancestor being sold for piano I mean it's just a heartbreaking story that Wilson is telling here um, and giving it a very real image we talked about a few lessons ago about the importance of props on stage and how they can theatrically animate a story and that's really good playwriting when it's not just people standing around talking or sitting around talking but that we have real tangible things that help um, elucidate or serve as an image for a larger experience. Um, it's always a little bit confusing for people the yellow dog reference uh, because it doesn't come later it doesn't come until the explanation doesn't come from boy Willie until later in the story um, but the the train it sounds like a dog when it's whistling from far away it sounds like a dog so uh, they call the Yazoo train there the yellow dog um, so in this uh, incident where Bernice's husband pulls out a gun and is killed and then in retribution a whole box car full of people are burned up um, and it's just sort of a um, speaking to this these souls of these people who've been served this injustice and it's a symbol of that you know the ground crying out to us of its injustice and so when we see these ghosts and uh, when we feel this sense of um, eeriness in the air and the sense of injustice it's a I think it's really it almost draws attention to it for it to be the yellow dog that we don't really get to know it on a deeper level until later uh, in the story there's a lot of sort of anticipation of that um, the the opening to the show we have that song from Skip James that Mississippi blues musician gin my cotton sell my seed buy my baby everything she need and we see this sort of dominant masculinity this idea that um, you have to own what what your um, that you have to own you have to earn your keep as a man right this this sense of um, belonging that comes from being able to quote buy your baby right um, to support your family uh, something that really comes into the theme of what boy Willie is going through so a prologue is not included in every script it's not included in piano lesson um, and sorry that was in my notes as, as what is at the beginning of the piano lesson is that sort of teaser and and much like with Raisin in the Sun I'm not sure that's something that the audience would ever hear it's more for us as playwrights uh, as interpreters of a play to help us interpret it 
right? It's like a dedication. We wouldn't necessarily have it verbalized. Although in a modern era, we might have it projected somewhere. Or it can help us tell the story. But our play, you know, begins with those Skip James lyrics. And a lot of um, August Wilson's plays have references to blues. It's a part of the way that he really says his people tell their stories. Um, a more traditional prologue, of course, the most famous one is from Romeo and Juliet, two households, both alike in dignity and fair Verona, where we lay our scene, right? These introduce the background story, set up the play. They're often direct address, so they're recited as, you know, looking at the audience and different, not all scripts include a prologue and a epilogue. Classical plays often do. And sometimes there's sort of a twist on that in modern plays of a prologue or an epilogue. One of my favorite moments of Midsummer Night's Dream is they're doing a play within the play and it's horrible. <laughs> and Bottom offers an epilogue and, and all of the audience members say, no, no, we don't need an epilogue. We don't need an epilogue. <laughs> and some directors, when they're doing cuttings of classical pieces, will cut the epilogue because it's sort of handing your audience how, to, how it all wraps up together. Arthur Miller wrote an epilogue and I have a picture here grainy one, albeit, I'm sorry for that, of Death of a Salesman, where they're at their funeral of uh, Willie Loman, and we find out that he's paid off the house, and that um, his struggle was almost over, and he gave up too soon, according to his wife, and so we kind of get a little bit of wrapping up the story through the epilogue, but basically it just gives us a larger context for the stories. So, this is a really common device by playwrights and once you start looking for it you find it everywhere um, and that is character foils and parallelisms so if we look at two characters like Pinky and the Brain from Animaniacs right we have one who's really really tall Pinky and one who's really really short the brain and they're opposites and they when you put them side by side there's an antithesis there where they look even more juxtaposed than they would otherwise a very sophisticated language to analyze a cartoon I realize <laughs> so yeah there's a great movie twins if you've never seen it with Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger we have these really really um, honest tall buff man standing next to this short conniving guy and they look even more the opposite based on who they are so this is a really common device for Wilson Maddie and Molly for those of you who've read, read Joe Turner's Come and Gone but in this one I think we have um, Doker and Whining Boy right they're the same age basically uh, Doker you can see standing there he has been financially stable he is connected to his history and his past he is um, successful and Whining Boy is goofy he's still telling the same stories he's still of the same age he's got the same knowledge in his head but he's a lot more of a of a scandal of, of someone who um, you know is out to get away with what he can get away with and borrow money from everybody so when we have these characters who we are can easily compare them we can easily compare them and you as as a costumer can play with that you know how in what ways do they share the same costume in what ways as a director do you have them side by side if you're casting the parts do they look similar do they not so how can we play up that parallelism in order to use that sense of comparison that the playwright isn't intending and I would also argue that Boy Willie and um, and his sister Bernice are in some ways parallel you can always draw a co comparison but some playwrights are really intentional about putting in those parallelism those characters who foil each other and serve as character foils to each other so um, if you if you're ever doing a character foil a Venn diagram is very helpful um, so let's read just a little passage here um, so boy will Willie walks in uh, and uh, Bernice says what you doing all that hollering for hey Bernice Stoker said you was asleep I said at least you could get up and say hi and remember their brother and sister it's five o'clock in the morning you come in here with all that noise you can't come in like a normal folks you gotta bring all that noise in with you right it's such a beautiful turn of phrase like he's he's got the noise he's packed it in his bags so he's gonna unpack it <laughs> hell I ain't done nothing but come in and say hi I ain't gotta got in the house good Bernice says 
that's what I'm talking about. You start all that hollering and carrying on as soon as you hit the door. Boy, Willie. Ah, hell, woman. I was glad to see Doker. You ain't had to come down if you didn't want to. I seen eight. I come 1,800 miles to see my sister. I figure she might want to get up and say hi. Other than that, you can go back upstairs. What you got, Doker? Where your bottle? Me and Lyman want to drink. <laughs> he wants to immediately start partying. This is Lyman. You remember Lyman Jackson from down home. And so, uh, and like I said, he, all this slang, talking about fixing to, hollering, um, you know, he immediately throws in about uh, Sutter dying, and they paint a very vivid picture of this horrible um, white man whose generations have suppressed their people, fallen, that guy falling down a well like Humpty Dumpty, you know. So there's a very down-to-earth tone to it. Um, it. It should sound like people talk, but there's definitely a rhythm to it, right? When you're saying it aloud, you can feel the rhythms of it, and um, it it sounds like poetry, and people speak poetically through it. So dialogue is something, um, anything, or anything that is a passage of talk. Obviously, monologue is where one person is talking. Um, and as we analyze dialogue, we can often analyze it just like poetry. We can mark um, the imagery, the symbolism, the antithesis, how to play up the language in a way that um, helps paint a visual picture for your audience. Um, so, this is there's a lot in your book about analyzing dialogue and I haven't chosen to talk about all of it um, but I do think it's important going in early in your theater career to understand the difference between prose and poetry so you've probably heard of iambic pentameter um, it it means that an I am is unstressed stressed rhythm right so to be or not to be that is the question all right we have unstressed stress, unstressed stress, unstressed stress, unstressed stress, unstressed stressed. Right, I have a picture of Topher Grace there because his name um, is not an I am, it's Christopher, right? That first syllable, Chris, is where most people are going to put the emphasis. So that's where his nickname is probably uh, going to come from, right? If I have a student named Lakeisha, most people aren't going to call her La, they're going to call her Keisha. So whatever the stress syllable is, is usually what the nickname is going to come from. So Topher is kind of clever because most people go by Chris, right? So it's f 10 syllables, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress. And that's sort of the pace and the feel of the poetry. Gallop of pace, you fiery footed steeds. And of course, when you're saying it, you don't want to play the poem just completely perfect to the rhyme and to the pace but you want to be aware of it and especially as the difference in the pronunciation right sometimes you have to lie at those syllables and um, we do this in music and poetry all the time we we um, use looking good in them jeans uh, you combine and allied words together for the sake of um, of rhythm they do not love that do not show their love beautiful line from Midsummer Night's Dream there. They do not love that do not show their love. And so you can see every other syllable is emphasized. That is in a perfect iambic pentameter. Um, so switching back, when you're looking at a great text and uh, you can see down the side here of Quince's line how nothing is capitalized except the first word or a proper noun. But when we swim to when Puck walks in, Robin there walks in, we switch to iambic pentameter. When hemp and hunts bones have we swaggering here, so near the cradle of the fairy queen, what a play toward I'll be the auditor, uh, an actor too perhaps if I see cause. So we switch into that poetry and that um, sense of granted. And when do we switch from poetry to po prose? It's usually uh, the characters. Some characters speak more in poetry. Usually the royalty, the smarter characters are going to speak in poetry. But sometimes if we have a character like Romeo, he switches into poetry when he sees Juliet for the first time, right? He switches into poetry when he starts uh, a, a long soliloquy. And we see that in Hamlet too, 
right? Um, that when the heart rate goes up, that's when we start feeling that heartbeat through the rhythms of, of the language. So, um, and that's not to say, I don't mean to say prose and poetry and saying that August Wilson piano lists and isn't poetry because it is beautiful poetry. But when we're talking about it in terms of analyzing dialogue, we mean to say that if it has a rhythm, we want to respect that rhythm. Something we, a, a play we didn't cover that they talk about is Tartuffe, right? And the entire play is rhyming couplets. And so when we get into looking at the language of it, um, we want to make sure to play with that rhyme and have fun with that rhyme, um, just like you would with a Seuss book or something. Um, that some words kind of have more of a playful wit about them and so we can play that action we can play those dialects and have fun with those dialects and accents um, and of course that's a whole nother class that you'll have if you're an actor higher up in your training is mastering these dialects and um, that's something that uh, is really important for August Wilson's plays that they be representative of the African American exp experience. They're written in heavy dialect, and depending on what part of the country they're living in, they represent different dialects, but all part of the African American experience, except for the oddball white person here and there in a August Wilson play. Connotations. So we know that Boy Willie is a farmer and that he's coming early in the century into um, the north carrying watermelons and there's a long history of archetyping and stereotyping with watermelons that most people would have a connotation for in the audience we see in the middle here the pickaninny the um, stereotype the hurtful stereotype that was depicted through cartoons of of a black young child often in immediate danger it's supposed to be funny I don't think it is just to clarify um, you know it wasn't unusual to see a pickaninny you know with a crocodile nearby or a baboon nearby and the pickaninny is is bait um, and I think to an extent August Wilson is sort of poking at Boy Willie's larger than life sensibility that he is um, in some ways childlike you know just thinking that he can come up here and and get his money and and go so I do think that the watermelons probably do have that connotation that August Wilson is intentional about using that as part of the story but it also just speaks to the South right people associate watermelons rightly so with American South and that um, that Boy Willie is coming from an agricultural society up to Pittsburgh that's more industrialized the Pittsburgh is booming with the railroad it's really open doors and um, you know made a huge difference but Boy Willie is still kind of coming in on this old raggedy truck and trying to you know beat down the road in an old-fashioned way um, and he's in some ways he's kind of stuck in the past he wants to he wants to go towards his future but he's living on this farmland that his ancestors have lived on suffering in some ways the same fate as his former um, as his as his ancestors and uh, sharecropping is man the way that the south was made in slavery obviously but sharecropping really wasn't that much more humane I mean the workers rights were minuscule the idea that they could ever get out of debt or pay back was um, astronomical so I think boy Willie is coming from a place of desperation when he comes to his sister he needs her to understand um, he needs her to give her the money he needs to make a change now or he is um, desperate and he has big huge strong emotions expressed through his language too I mean to the point where people are pulling guns on each other right he's he's so threatening he's so masculine he comes in kind of like that um, intro you know he's got that need to take his dreams by by the shoulders and shake them so our last term of the day is subtext this is one of my favorite moments in the script between um, Bernice and Lyman and how he's got his perfume here and he's putting it on her and smelling it and, and he's just such a sweetly innocent character and she of course is still mourning her husband she's still a widow and 
we don't really know that anything happened, but we have a pretty clear subtext painted. Um, subtext is a very important concept in Stanislavski's work. In fact, if you're doing something as kind of coded language as three sisters, you really need to sit down and almost have what the character really means, almost like if you were transcribing it from a different language. What is what's being said, but what does the character really mean? And flirtation is infamously easy to pick up on subtext, right? You're talking about the weather, but really you're flirting because we're very rarely is, you know, Lyman just going to come out and say, hey, let's have sex, right? He's not going to be that overt. Um, uh, Bernie Swift has laughed him across the face, I have a feeling. But when we're speaking in subtext, we can almost, you know, say what the true unspoken words were. And I say they are implied by the actor, but of course implied by the playwright as well. Forgive my lazy interpretation of subtext. But Stanislavski really honored that as something that playwrights should continue to do because it's the way that we talk, right? Um, sometimes we're using subtext or guarded language because it's something too ugly to talk about. If you look at all of the ways we talk about death without really talking about death, right, um, you know, in a better place, they've gone on. Uh, very rarely do we just say dead, right? It's an ugly word. So how can we, through our verbal intonation, through our facial expressions, through our gestures, elucidate the text? And if you, as the director, are blocking a scene with a lot of insinuation, you need to make it sure that both of your characters um, are kind of on the same page. doesn't mean that one can't be naive to the intentions of the other, but you want to see that that undercurrent is being honored. So I'm skipping a lot in this section and, and hoping that a lot of it is sort of intuitive for you when we're looking at dialogue to um, compare what are some of the di dichotomies he has here. So paying attention to punctuation, to rhythm, these are things that we'll, we'll talk more about in your acting class um, if you do take that, um, these dichotomies that he talks about, formal versus informal, abstract language versus concrete language, all of these things are good ways to sit and analyze um, a story. Um, and of course, with every story that you get into, just finding the voice of that character. I mean that through your physiology, through the way that you, the voice that you put on for the character, but also the kinds of things they say, right? Um, unfortunately, we all get into situations as actors sometimes where we probably have to improvise. Somebody's forgotten a line, somebody drops a prop, um, and we need to make sure that we know that character, we've got stepped into that character's skin enough um, to improvise those lines and speak with the dialogue that the, that the author would have uh, intended. Not that I am in any way encouraging you to go off book, but 75% um, accuracy is all we have to have according to the um, actor's equity standards. So uh, a, a rogue word here and there is still going to tell the story and it's live theater, so it's going to happen. But I love August Wilson. I hope I've communicated that today. Um, he tells these stories of people who were given, weren't given a voice and um, he tells these stories of the South and uncovers the ugliness, even though they're set in the North, they're often reflecting on a, a situation that people have escaped from in their heritage. And, um, you know, having uh, driven these same roads that Boy Willie was, uh, as a literary figure, was on, makes it a play a little closer to my heart. So, how do we deal with our ghosts? It's an important question. How do we deal with our dialogue as actors and directors and designers equally as important? So uh, thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this section of um, script analysis for actors, designers, and directors. <laughs>